with the Federal Aviation Administration concluding its investigation into the anomaly during the first integrated flight test of Starship, SpaceX is currently awaiting authorization to launch the second test flight. During the investigation, the FAA identified multiple root causes of the Starship failure, and SpaceX came up with corrective actions designed to mitigate and prevent the same issues from occurring again. CEO Elon Musk recently released the list of 63 corrective actions taken, which were then submitted to the FAA for approval. Six of those 63 will be completed on later flights. According to SpaceX, a propellant leak at the aft end of Super Heavy Booster 7 was the cause of the loss of connection with the vehicle's primary flight computer during the April 20 launch. This led to a loss of communication with the majority of booster engines and ultimately, the control of the vehicle. SpaceX has added sensors to each engine bay to detect and manage methane leaks from Raptors and prevent anomalies during future missions. They have also replaced several seals within valves, manifolds, and flanges, and added more torque to bolts to reduce the leaking of propellant. Engineers also added stronger shielding around each of the booster's 33 Raptor engines to protect them from explosions of nearby engines, a measure intended to reduce the chance of cascading failures. SpaceX has also upgraded the flight termination system to ensure the timely destruction of the vehicle in the event of an anomaly. The company also made several upgrades to the orbital launch mount and pad, including significant reinforcements to the pad foundation and the installation and testing of the water deluge system. In addition to these, SpaceX has made over a thousand other modifications to the Starship, including a full suite of system performance upgrades, such as the hot stage separation system and a new electronic thrust vector control system for the Super Heavy Raptor engines. Now, with all those corrective actions implemented, SpaceX must convince the FAA that they will prevent the same failures from occurring on the next Starship test flight. After that, SpaceX must obtain a modified FAA license to launch, which necessitates a review of the Starship's flight trajectory, accident probabilities, and other factors affecting nearby public safety. According to Tom Ocenero, Vice President of Commercial Sales at SpaceX, the company is really close to the next Starship launch and is working closely with the regulators at this point. SpaceX's Starship program general manager, Kathy Luters, said on Thursday that the second launch could be in about two to three weeks. I think we're in the final kind of process of going through that compliance matrix, working the verification. But the FAA needs to be able to have the time to go through it all. And we, we have meeting, we've been obviously meeting very closely together. And um, I'm hoping that we get this done in the next two or three weeks. One of the key things you got to do is to be able to do the flight termination system, like I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and then the team will go through and just do one more time looking through the vehicle. That team and their responsible engineers for each of the areas are diligently continuing to look through all the issue tickets, figuring out is there anything else that they can be doing to make this vehicle and, and the mission be as successful as possible. The acting head of the FAA, Holly Trottenberg, said on September 13 that the agency could advance a launch license as early as October. So, based on the recent updates from SpaceX and FAA officials, it looks like the launch might happen in the first week of October. SpaceX would still need a separate environmental approval from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service before a launch, and we still have no information on how long that might take. During the 2023 All-In Summit held in Los Angeles, Musk gave some updates regarding the next launch. Uh, we believe we've, we've completed the remaining um, items requested by the FAA, so we should get our license hopefully soon. Um, but re really, the only thing holding back uh, second flight of Starship at this point is the regular flight approval. I hope we'll have a 50% chance of getting to stage separation, um, and maybe a close to 50% chance of getting to orbit if the hot staging the new separation method uh, is at works. He also posted on X that the second integrated flight test has a much higher chance of success than the first flight. SpaceX teams at Starbase, responsible for the design and assembly of the Starship launch vehicle and ground infrastructure, recently gathered in front of the fully stacked launch vehicle for this iconic photograph. A similar photo was taken weeks before the first integrated flight test in April. As the launch was delayed, on Thursday, September 14, SpaceX de-stacked the ship from the booster. After receiving approval from the FAA, SpaceX will install the flight termination system on the ship and the booster and stack them for launch. A full stack wet dress rehearsal would normally take place before launch, however, there are currently no signs that SpaceX intends to undertake the test, but things could change as the launch date approaches. 
One of the possible reasons SpaceX has yet to complete the wet dress rehearsal is that they may have chosen to focus on the ongoing water deluge system repair work, as closing the pad for rocket testing would delay the repairs. The installation of the large water storage tank, which was delivered to the launch site last month, is still ongoing. A new deluge system manifold was delivered to the launch site a week ago to replace the damaged old manifold. The third large deluge system water tank was lifted, aligned, and connected with the newly delivered manifold on September 9. Minor repair works are still ongoing on the deluge system, and once they are completed, we will witness a deluge system water discharge test. The deluge system must be completely operational for the Starship to launch, so let's hope the repair doesn't take too long. The orbital tank farm has also received upgrades lately, including the installation of new heat exchangers and pumps to speed up the processes of cooling and loading propellants into the launch vehicle. SpaceX recently shared two videos showing two kinds of Raptor engine testing conducted at SpaceX's McGregor test facility. The first test is a Raptor vacuum engine firing after being chilled down to mimic in-space conditions after a long coast phase. The test that lasted for five seconds demonstrated the restart capability of Raptor engines in space. The second test is a sea-level engine burn that lasted more than 30 seconds to demonstrate a landing burn on the lunar surface. The test results will aid in the development of Starship and Raptor engines for Artemis missions. Work is underway on Starship 26, which was rolled out to the launch site on September 7 for static fire testing. Soon, the ship will fire all six of its Raptor engines on suborbital launch pad B. As you may have noticed, Ship 26 differs significantly from earlier Starship prototypes in a number of ways. Please check out my previous video to find out what those design modifications are and why SpaceX implemented those changes on Ship 26. Link in the description. Super Heavy Booster 10 was moved to the Massey's test site last Monday morning. The booster was cryo-tested on Wednesday evening by filling the methane tank with supercooled fluids. It was the booster's second cryogenic proof test. After the first test in July, the booster was moved into the Mega Bay for minor design upgrades, and the next round of tests at Massey's will test the integrity of those changes. Super Heavy Booster 11 was moved into the Mega Bay last Tuesday morning. Just like Booster 10, Booster 11 will also undergo cryo tests once work inside the Mega Bay is complete. SpaceX has finished the stacking of Booster 12 in the Mega Bay lately, and the prototype is currently getting its raceway and other items installed. Booster 13 ring sections were spotted moving into the Mega Bay lately, and teams have begun stacking the liquid oxygen tank section of the booster. Starship 28 is near the Rocket Garden, and teams are working on its engines to prepare the vehicle for static fire tests. Ships 29 and 30 have been fully stacked and are currently sitting inside the high bay. Stacking of Ship 31 has also begun inside the high bay. Now, let's discuss some of the biggest updates in the world of science and technology from the past week. Texas-based small launch company Firefly Aerospace launched the third flight of its Alpha launch vehicle as part of a dedicated mission for the U.S. Space Force. The mission, dubbed Victus Knox, lifted off from Space Launch Complex 2 at Vandenberg Space Force Base in California on Thursday, September 14. The vehicle passed through the area of maximum dynamic pressure at approximately one minute into the flight. Stage separation happened at around 2 minutes 30 seconds after liftoff, and payload fairing was jettisoned 50 seconds later, exposing the Victus Knox payload to space. The second stage then continued to burn to place the satellite into the intended orbit. A few hours after the launch, Firefly announced that the mission was successful and that the payload had been delivered to its targeted destination in low Earth orbit. The Victus Knox mission served as a demonstration of the United States' capability to quickly place a satellite in orbit in response to a national security threat, if the need ever arises. On August 30, Firefly announced they are officially on hot standby, which means that the Space Force anticipates having the satellite and rocket ready for launch at any point in the upcoming six months. Firefly had a 60-hour window after getting an alert from the Space Force to transport the payload to the launch site, fuel the vehicle, and integrate the payload with the rocket. Then the Space Force issued another notice with the final orbit requirements, giving Firefly just 24 hours to update the trajectory and guidance software, encapsulate the payload, transport it to the pad, and stand ready to launch at the first available window. The payload for the Victus Knox mission was manufactured by Millennium Space, a subsidiary of the Boeing company. The satellite specifications are unknown, although it is known that it will conduct a space domain awareness mission while in orbit. Victus Knox served as the third mission launched by Firefly Alpha, the world's largest carbon fiber rocket ever built, capable of sending a 1,170 kg payload into a low Earth orbit at a cost of $15 million per launch. 
The rocket's first stage is outfitted with four Reaver 1 engines that run on RP-1 and liquid oxygen propellants. The engines work together to produce a total thrust of 736.1 kN and a specific impulse of 296 seconds. Reaver utilizes the tap-off engine cycle, where pressure from the main combustion chamber is used to spin the engine turbine instead of a separate gas generator. However, since the exhaust gas used to spin the turbine is still expelled, the tap-off cycle is considered an open cycle engine. The second stage of the Alpha rocket is equipped with a single Lightning 1 engine, which is also a tap-off engine cycle capable of delivering 70 kN of thrust. Firefly's first orbital launch attempt with Alpha in September 2021 ended in failure after an engine shut down 14 seconds into the flight. The company reached orbit with Alpha on the second flight in October 2022, though the satellites were deployed at a lower than planned altitude, as such, the payloads re-entered the Earth's atmosphere approximately one week after launch. Firefly's next mission, Ilana-43, will launch nine CubeSats for NASA later in the year. A Soyuz rocket carrying the Soyuz MS-24 spacecraft lifted off from Baikonur Cosmodrome on September 15, flying a crew of three to the International Space Station. The crew of Soyuz MS-24 includes NASA astronaut Laura Lohara, alongside cosmonauts Oleg Kononenko and Nikolai Chubb. The launch was timed to put the Soyuz on an expedited path to the space station, and the crew docked at the ISS three hours after liftoff. During their time on the space station, the MS-24 crew will perform maintenance and spacewalks to keep the space station running and help conduct hundreds of science experiments. The MS-24 crew will relieve Soyuz MS-22 crew members delayed aboard the space station more than six months past their scheduled return to Earth. Last December, a leak aboard the MS-22 spacecraft docked at the ISS, extended its crew's mission, while their empty spacecraft was undocked and returned to Earth. The MS-23 Soyuz spacecraft was then launched to the space station in February to bring the stranded astronauts and cosmonauts home as early as September 27. NASA and its international partners approved the crew for Axiom Space's third private astronaut mission to the International Space Station, launching aboard a SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft no earlier than January 2024. Axiom Space's chief astronaut and former NASA astronaut Michael Lopez Allegria will command the private mission. Italian Air Force Colonel Walter Villade will serve as the pilot. The two mission specialists are Alper Jezeravsi of Turkey and ESA Project astronaut Marcus Want of Sweden. Lopez Allegria is one of NASA's all-time top spacewalkers, with 10 extravehicular activities totaling 67 hours and 40 minutes. After arriving at the ISS, the AX-3 astronauts plan to spend up to 14 days on board, implementing a full mission comprised of microgravity research, educational outreach, and commercial activities. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.